Hi everyone, my name is Pepe Martinez, and today I'll be presenting Coins, COVID Canes, and K Shape Recovery, along with my co authors, William Huang and Bud Mishra. Uh, I just want to give a special thanks to Kos John at NYU Stern and she at the University of Ottawa, as well as Aris Covea for all their help and guidance uh, during this. Um, so, first, I want to give a little background into how my co authors and I got together. So, William and I were taking an undergraduate hypothesis based class at NYU uh, with Bud Mishra. And our hypothesis was that Keynesian monetary policy is largely responsible for today's income inequality, inflated asset prices, and suboptimal full employment. Uh, and so what we essentially tried to do is um, do some simple linear regression um, against uh, Fed mandate using Fed policy to see if the Fed was achieving what they were setting out to do. Uh, and our conclusion was that it seems that today um, distribution is pretty complicated and relatively inefficient. Um, and there's a limited insight into after funds are received what is done with those funds, um, who uses them, uh, what they're used for, um, etc. And so it's quite difficult to uh, distribute funds in an effective uh, and deterministic way. Uh, and so we teamed up with Rx Covea, uh, which is a group of uh, volunteers spanning just about every country, continent, sorry. Um, and it represent we represent a, um, you know, quite a, a large um group uh, spectrum of disciplines from biologists to chemists to computer scientists um, to mathematicians all trying to uh, help COVID in any way we possibly can uh, be it from uh, vaccinations the economy testing uh, etc uh, particularly uh, I'm interested in economics and so uh, I first want to take a quick look at current monetary policy today as employed by the Federal Reserve so we can get a, a baseline of uh, what the issues are with monetary policy and where we are today. Um, and so before I talk about monetary policy, uh, I should talk about uh, the man who uh, is coined the father of macroeconomics, uh, Sir John Maynard Keynes, um, who was uh, you know, a pretty well-known and well-spoken uh, government interventionist uh, who, you know, circa 1930, argued for uh, the government to intervene during economic downturns um, when consensus, economic consensus at the time, was that markets would self-correct and that, uh, you know, in the long run, uh, markets, um, you know, are self-correcting and, you know, you don't need government intervention. Uh, however, Keynes's most popular quote is, uh, the long run is a misleading guide to current affairs. In the long run, we are all dead. And so what he means by this is essentially um, there's no point in waiting for markets to self-correct if we can do something today and if the government can do something today. Uh, as well as he was uh, pretty apt in identifying that, um, you know, the economy runs in sort of an income uh, feedback loop where somebody's income is someone else's spending. Um, and so, uh, you know, sometimes economies can enter these negative uh, depression spirals and, uh, you know, you may require government to get out of it, uh, although it's, you know, highly debated topic today. Uh, so Fed policy uh, today can be categorized as being Keynesian. Um, as it's generally enacted uh, to stabilize the economy during uh, recession. And so the two main tools the Fed uses to do this is the interest rate uh, or the Fed funds rate and quantitative easing QE, uh, also known as balance sheet expansion. And so um, the interest rate, uh, the Fed funds rate, essentially is the overnight lending rate at the Fed. And this rate sets the rest of the rates in the economy, um, more, more or less, uh, not directly or exactly. Um, but more or less, every other uh, interest rate in the economy, from bank prime to personal loan rates to credit cards, um, are all determined by the Fed funds rate. And so the Fed can either lower this rate to spur uh, economic um, uh, growth um, by encouraging borrowers to spend more uh, and borrow more, uh, or they can raise the interest rate, um, you know, deterring borrowers from borrowing uh, and reducing spending. Uh, and so this has generally been effective in the past. Um, you know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago when we can take interest rates from 12% to, uh, you know, 8% or 7.5%. Um, but in today's environment where we can take interest rates from 1.25% to zero, uh, there's not a huge difference. And so the Fed has had to resort to a significant amount of quantitative easing or balance sheet expansion, uh, which is essentially uh, the Federal Reserve uh, printing money to purchase financial assets or, you know, creating money to purchase financial assets. Uh, those assets include short-term government debt bonds, mortgage-backed securities, uh, corporate debt bonds and even longer-term debt bonds. Uh, as you can see here, what I'm trying to show is that uh, it seems that these programs expand and they only get bigger. Um, and over time, um, you know, more money is, is, is spent by the Fed. And so it really brings into question 
um, how is that money being spent, where is it going, and what is it being used for, uh, as it's such a vast amount of money. Uh, so what is the Fed trying to uh, achieve by all of this? Um, you know, they're trying to basically, you know, uh, bring the economy into a recovery after a recession or an economic downturn. And so uh, economists have developed this recovery alphabet. Um, uh, that blue dotted line is trend GDP, which has run at 2% in the U.S. for the last uh, 200 years and is considered basically U.S. economic potential. And so we try and basically stay on that blue dotted line as much as possible. Uh, and so the Fed is there to, if we step off that line, to uh, do expansionary monetary policy to try and influence that line to go back to trend. So we have the V-shape, the Z-shape are probably uh, the two shapes that the Fed, um, you know, tries to achieve, um, which is, you know, we do have a decline, but we have a, you know, a very steep recovery and, uh, you know, we're right back on trend. Or a Z-shape in which we actually almost make up for the previous losses by, um, you know, more growth than, than the normal um, to try and get back to trend. Uh, something like the L-shape is the least desirable as the economy never fully recovers and we basically stay below trend for, you know, an extended period of time. Uh, and so the Fed tries to have basically achieve a V-shape. Uh, however, we're arguing that uh, what we're kind of experiencing more today is a K-shape. Uh, what a K-shape means is that the uh, higher income bracket is the top of the K. And so you can see here that um, uh, people making over $32 an hour uh, in January, from January to June of 2020 uh, actually saw wage... Um, actually saw more employment, you know, higher paid uh, income, um, uh, higher income earners uh, received uh, more employment uh, during this downturn. And uh, those maybe who need funds most, um, lower income um, workers actually uh, saw the uh, worst decline of uh, employment and the most unemployment. Uh, and so this is what we mean by this K-shape in which it seems that higher income earners uh, seem to be doing better uh, while the lower half um, of the income spectrum seems to increasingly be doing worse. Uh, and so this is where we get um, that, that K-shape, and the divergence between that uh, is basically your income inequality, or, uh, you know, your um, income inequality gap. And so, um, you know, it's important to look at what is the Federal Reserve's mandate then. Uh, so their mandate is to essentially lower unemployment uh, as much as possible uh, and reach maximum full employment. Um, and so you may think, well, I mean, the Fed could just print all the money in the world and give us all, you know, jobs, quote unquote, and provide us income. Um, however, that is uh, very inflationary. And so that's their constraint there on the y-axis uh, is core inflation. Uh, and they try and keep that at a steady rate. Um, and so uh, the Fed has set core inflation to 2% and the unemployment rate to four and a quarter. Um, although I think it's important to note that these are arbitrary made up numbers. Um, there is no natural unemployment rate uh, and there is no um, hundred percent agreed upon inflation rate that uh, any country should have um, and so you know these are uh, generally hard numbers to reach as they're uh, sort of arbitrary um, so we decided to do some data analysis um, on the two predictor variables the interest rate and the balance sheet which is fed policy and the response variables which is um, the CPI or inflation rate uh, the unemployment rate and we added a third one which is delinquency rates on commercial and industrial loans because particularly in the COVID crisis businesses were hit pretty hard uh, with shutdowns and things of that nature and so uh, we wanted to uh, take a look at that as well uh, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly because uh, just for the sake of time and so uh, balance sheet versus unemployment um, we can see here there's actually um, you know no correlation at all between uh, you know expansionary monetary policy um, printing money to purchase financial assets and lowering unemployment um, I guess somewhat intuitively this makes sense. Um, why that mechanism would work uh, is more difficult to you know understand. Um, but yeah, here we see there's no correlation, and so it's difficult to argue why we would be doing expansionary monetary policy in the sense of raising the balance sheet and you know purchasing more financial assets, um, as it seems to have very little effect on the actual unemployment rate. Um, here we have the balance sheet versus the delinquency rate. Once again, here we see you know a, um, a pretty low correlation. Uh, between the balance sheet and delinquencies uh, as um, you know when the Fed is purchasing financial assets it's not bailing out everybody it's bailing out few uh, some and so not all you know delinquent uh, businesses are, are saved from from balance sheet expansion and so that's what we see a generally low correlation between the two uh, interest rates versus delinquency here we have the you know the same effect uh, lowering interest rates um, seem to have no true effect on um, the delinquency rate 
as um, the majority of businesses can't loan at the Fed funds rate. And so by them lowering the rate, it you know may, may not help many businesses. And uh, additionally, um, you know, businesses that may be insolvent uh, or can't pay make interest payments at 2% may still not be able to make interest payments at 1% if their businesses were shut down. Uh, they still have no income. And so lowering that interest rate doesn't necessarily always help uh, delinquent businesses. Um, here we have interest rates versus unemployment, and here we actually see a positive correlation um, between the two, showing that um, it seems that lowering the interest rate um, does not actually also lower unemployment. Uh, it actually seems to have a backwards effect. Um, and so in general, our conclusions from this was it seems that you know Fed policy is not necessarily correlated to or affecting the things they're um, you know setting out to affect directly at least. It's, uh, and so it makes um, their job very difficult. Um, and, it, and it brings into question the effectiveness of, uh, you know, spending such a vast amount of money. Um, and so this is where we get uh, the case shape. Uh, and so what we, um, you know, see in general is that uh, it seems as though the higher income earners um, are seem to be doing better um, and lower income earners are um, seem to be progressively doing worse over time. And so uh, why is that? Uh, one possible explanation is that uh, intuitively, this sort of makes sense. Here in the blue, you can see uh, the balance sheet uh, and a percentage change. And in the red, you can see the S&P 500 or the stock market. And you can see that as soon as the stock market you know, you know, uh, took a downturn in uh, early March uh, during the, the beginning of the COVID uh, crisis, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve the, uh, essentially purchased around $3.7 trillion worth of assets. Uh, and really quickly, that um, you know, had the uh, stock market recover. Um, and as the rest of the economic data was coming out, such as GDP and unemployment uh, and, and, and all the rest of the you know, payroll numbers, the economy was progressively doing worse while the stock market was progressively doing better. Um, and you know, the majority of the owner of the stock market, around 85%, is owned by the 1%. And so you know, it makes sense intuitively if the Federal Reserve's main policy is going to be to purchase financial assets, well, I mean, it would make sense that that would raise the prices of financial assets. And that would make sense to benefit those who own financial assets. Uh, and so that's where we get this K-shape from. Uh, and so we decided that um, there seems to be a large issue with how money is distributed um, today, particularly, you know, uh, you know, particularly on a governmental level, um, but in general. And so we decided to look uh, elsewhere where distribution seems to be a problem. Um, and so we found that, uh, you know, there was $36 billion of collection fraud just from that 2020 um, uh, April stimulus bill. And in uh, the U.S. Uh, Department of Labor uh, estimates that annually um, they lose about $3.5 billion to unemployment insurance fraud. Uh, and then public charities, um, you know, on average annually um, lose about $100 billion to fraud. And so there seems to be a large uh, problem between, you know, how money is distributed today and uh, what happens after money is distributed um, for whatever purpose it may be. It may, may be a, a nonprofit or government stimulus programs, et cetera. It seems that the, the system that we have today for distributing money and ensuring where that money goes uh, is not very effective or, or transparent. Um, uh, and so we thought this was, um, you know, prime um, for, uh, for uh, some smart contracts. So uh, current fund distribution problems include, uh, as we've seen before, you know, lax verification um, and inability to detect fraud, uh, you know, in real time. Uh, inability to prevent recipient and spending fraud at the distribution level, a lack of KYC, um, and so a lot of um, there's a lot of you know money that's not wasted necessarily would be the word, but um, maybe misused by people applying to multiple programs um, and receiving more money than you know maybe was uh, thought that you know would be possible for somebody to do uh, because there is no tracking between the databases of all these different governmental programs. Um, they're, you know, all centralized uh, within their themselves. Um, they're also limited in the ways they can control spending once a recipient receives money. And so once funds are distributed, there is no way to verify where that money goes, what it's spent on, and if it's spent on the intended purpose of, you know, distributing that money. Um, there's also a lack of transparency uh, and an issue with centralized brokers. And so if you have a nonprofit, for example, and that nonprofit were to get hacked, um, you know, the entire nonprofit would uh, lose its um, money and funds. And, um, you know, th th that's an issue with being centralized. And so we decided um, to come up with the Maneki protocol. 
So the Mnecht protocol is a smart contract protocol that enables trustless distribution of funds and spend tracking to enforce fraud in real time. Um, so then it can, the Maneki Nakamoto protocol is a layer two solution built on top of uh, a payment token, such as a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, or an ERC20 token, et cetera. Uh, currently, um, we are trying to get the idea out there um, and see if there's interest. Um, you know, there are no hard implementation details as of, the, as of this moment. Um, but, you know, this would be built on top of an existing um, payment token. And this would basically provide the ability to create decentralized nonprofit uh, funds. Um, by private citizens, philanthropists, or even governments if they choose to participate. Um, and so um, there are two stakeholders within the protocol. There are donors and there are recipients. Donors can uh, execute uh, these series of smart contracts, fund create, fund update, and fund distribute. Uh, we'll go more into what those are later. Uh, and recipients can either request funds or spend funds. And so Maneki uh, registration. Uh, would be uh, individual and account uh, businesses would be separate. Uh, account creation would be enforced by uh, KYC. Uh, if this was implemented on top of a CBDC, uh, well, the central authority of the federal government has the uh, you know data source to do KYC with your social and everything. So, um, or if not, you know, an existing provider such as Civic uh, would be used. Um, it would be one account per individual, and so if you try and sign up with multiple addresses, uh, Maneki will you know sort of fingerprint you and remember and uh, attach all of your addresses to one individual or one account uh, to avoid from double dipping in multiple funds and programs or double dipping in the same fund twice uh, and reputational civil attacks. Um, recipients also um, can specify uh, to automatically enroll in funds upon their registration. And so when they register with KYC, uh, you know, their information would be um, acquired from an Oracle and, you know, there'd be the income level, their geography, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how many dependents, you know, it, you know, that data would be, would be um, used to basically see if they qualify for certain funds. And we can automatically enroll them in those funds. Uh, or if they would like, they can, uh, you know, run uh, the request funds contract and go and request funds um, that they think they should be eligible for. And so uh, the rules of, a of the fund distribution are flexible. Um, it basically allows any donor to direct money to the causes most aligned with um, their values. And um, you know, deterministically enforce that uh, when they donate money, it's spent the way uh, that they set it out to be. Um, you can set a time limit on uh, how much to submit money. This would be uh, very useful for the um, stimulus programs in which the government is trying to spur economic growth in the short term. And, you know, a majority of the, about 34% um, of, the, of the stimulus money, uh, a lot of it went to savings, and that's not something the government wants. They want, uh, you know, the, the, the fiscal authorities want uh, us to spend it uh, to, you know, provide someone else's income. And so that, um, you know, the economy, can, the economy can come out of recession. So, you know, something like spending a time limit on stimulus payments, coupons, um, could be extremely useful. Uh, as well as, um, you know, you could set criteria of the geography for donating. And so I could say I want to donate to uh, anybody within New York City. Um, and, you know, automatically I can get a list of, you know, eligible recipients. And all of this is, uh, you know, trustless uh, and decentralized. And so uh, the majority of this data, uh, all of this data would be sourced from, uh, you know, a trusted Oracle service such as uh, Chainlink or any other, uh, you know, Oracle um, provider. Uh, or if this was implemented on top of CBDC, um, you would have uh, the trusted Oracle would be, of course, the government databases. And so um, this is the process from a donor's perspective. Uh, and so the donor can uh, create a fund, update a fund, and distribute from a fund. Those are the three contracts. And so the fund to create, uh, they basically within here set the fund rules. They set the eligibility for recipients. Um, they set the governance of the fund, the voting structure, uh, you know, what the distribution schedule would, what is going to be. Um, if, you know, it's a yearly distribution, a weekly distribution, a one-time distribution, uh, the spending conditions, so what um, recipients can spend money on, what they can't spend money on, how long they have to spend the money, etc. You know, any any sort of rule uh, can be programmed into how the money can be spent uh, after it's, um, you know, uh, after it's distributed from the fund, and that's done within Fund Create. Um, within Fund Update, you can update those uh, contract rules and change certain things, uh, and how the Fund Update works is based off the governance uh, rules set in the creation of the fund. Um, as far as fund distribute, um, you can either trigger it manually 
uh, the, the administrators can trigger it manually or they can programmatically um, do it such as, you know, set a time limit such as I will, um, you know, there's a fund with a million dollars in it and within two weeks, you know, it'll, you know, there's a countdown and the money will uh, distribute to anybody who joins it, right? And so, you know, you can program at, you can programmatically set that um, and you can, um, you know, essentially what happens is that upon fund distribute, um, the smart contract reconciles the list of all eligible recipients to make sure that uh, the criteria still matches, that they still match the criteria for receiving the funds. And then, um, you know, a, a X amount of tokens are designated to each user. Uh, and this is all set by fund create. So it could, it could be, um, you know, just per person, um, you know, how much money uh, it could be, you know, some people receive more money than others. It can be, you know, equally shared, you know, how much money is there divided by how many people are participating. Uh, this is all set by fund create. And so, fund creators and donors can, uh, you know, create their funds to however they want to envision them. Uh, and so what this essentially allows people to create is decentralized nonprofit funds. Um, you know, donors, governments, or philanthropists can create, you know, create funds. Administrators can actually optimize funds over time by using fund update. And so um, after, you know, you create a fund, you can either deem it to be effective or ineffective and update your fund rules um, based on what, you know, you want your money to be spent on. Um, you know, there's fund distribute, which is a trustless and deterministic distribution of money, uh, as well as, uh, you know, requesting funds, recipients can request funds. Um, and then the, you know, one of the most important parts of this is spend tracking, which happens at the spend funds level. And so this is what enforces real time fraud and uh, deterministic spending. Um, and then, you know, you have the final purchase of the product or service. Um, so recipient spending um, is uh, you know, three faceted. One is spend tracking, which uh, validates the transactions based on the spending rules specified uh, within fund create. And so uh, within fund create, to give an example, you could set something as like, I'd like to give um, everyone in New York City, uh, or let's say anyone living within a certain borough in New York City, um, X amount of money, um, and they can only spend it at CVS. And so um, you know, you can really deterministically set what people can spend your donation money on. And so if you give and distribute money, um, you can ensure that uh, nobody will be going, um, you know, and, and gambling that money on something. Uh, they will spend it on, um, you can, they can only spend it on what you set them to spend it on. Uh, and so uh, this is done through product categorization. And so, um, you know, we've created a more robust version of the merchant category codes to enforce spending in real time on uh, intended products and services. Uh, and so we think MCC is generally outdated today uh, and not specific enough um, for this use case. And so we've created um, you know, a more robust version to actually track um, you know, where money's being spent on what businesses and what those businesses do. Uh, additionally, with recipient spending, there's spend provenance. And so data uh, can be collected at a fund, individual, or even business level uh, to provide aggregate spending data, allowing for uh, you know, fund creators to improve their fund rules and update their fund over time and if they see it's being effective or not effective. Um, and in general, I mean, a lot of this data can be used to figure out, you know, uh, you know what's the most um, what's the most needed thing or, or, or things of this nature. Uh, and because all of these, um, you know, transactions are immutable and up on the blockchain, you know, you can go back and uh, look at spend history. Uh, as well as at an individual level, see users um, or recipients who spend funds, um, you know, most useful or do the best with it. Uh, and so those are the three facets of uh, recipient spending. The use cases for this um, are pretty uh, vast. Um, a lot of it is within government stimulus uh, programs, uh, food stamp programs, unemployment insurance, um, as it seems to be, you know, a lack of transparency uh, or maybe trust with some of these programs. Additionally, um, all of these have, you know, uh, good amounts of um, fraud and things of this nature. Um, nonprofit organizations, uh, fundraising committees, uh, and really anything a fund creator can imagine. I mean, a donation can, uh, any, you know, you can send a donation to anybody with the name Pepe in New York City uh, or anything else you would like to. You know, it's free to uh, the fund creator's imagination. Um, and one of the most interesting things that we're thinking of is managing Keynesian supply shocks. And so real quick, uh, a Keynesian supply shock is essentially when you have a uh, sector shocked uh, demand and that demand moves to sector one. And so sector one starts doing a much, much, much better while sector two basically loses all demand. And so 
uh, today, monetary policy is generally ineffective at trying to, you know, balance these sector imbalances um, because, you know, it's done from a very centralized point of view with very little insight into the details between sectors and businesses, uh, individual businesses. And so with something like Maneki, you could set a you know, intertemporal smart contract between two sectors to dynamically sort of micromanage sectors uh, and set different interest rates between the sectors or um, set different uh, payroll taxes between the sectors to try and um, you know balance these things um, in real time during an economic downturn. Um, and yeah, thank you so much.